Hey everybody, it's Safi and Marco to shout out movies, the only movie review show on YouTube to review movies in terms of food. It's just Marco here once again, and I am here to talk about something very special. Special because it's important, it's something that it's it's not really talked about much because people feel like they can't talk about it because it's a taboo subject. They feel like it's something like, oh, I'm, I, I just, oh, it, it's happening, but I'm just going to ignore, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to pretend it isn't happening because that's what I did for three years. And look, look where it got me. And I know that people could say, oh, you're, of course you're doing this now because of your house being uh, taken away and being destroyed uh, your 1864 house being taken away and destroyed by an evil company called Kerwin Purple LLC. Of course, you're doing this now to get attention for that. Well, no. I've been planning on doing this video for months with my friend. Uh, she had, she would, would keep rescheduling and rescheduling, and so it just happened to be now. And I thought that you know, we did a little test interview from last night, and I felt like I should really do my own video because I need to really explain this story in the best, most detailed, honest way possible. Because this will be an extensive video. It will be something that it might be the biggest video I've ever done on this channel because it covers years and years and years of history. And now, here's a little disclaimer for you. I'm not doing this in any way to be exploitative. I am not doing this to seek attention, and I am not doing this to be disrespectful to Sharon. But, I need to talk about this, what's happened. Because it did happen, it is happening, and it's real. And I don't care what anybody says. You know, with these types of topics, you're going to have 50% of people who say, you're lying, you're a fraud, you're a fake, liar. Then you're going to have 50% of people saying, I, oh, that's terrible, I believe you, oh, that's really bad. And that's just the reality of things. Now, here's the thing. I was brought up to tell the truth. Sure, I do lie sometimes, like for little things like, uh, you know, like when I was a kid, I would be like, oh, I, I didn't get into the Oreo cookies. You know, I, I didn't do that. And, you know, I've lied a couple of times. Of course, everyone has. But I fully believe in the power of the truth. The truth will set you free. And this is going to be the first time that I tell the truth. And, and I mean by the truth, I mean about the story, about fully getting everything out there that I possibly can think of so that you guys can see this picture in its fullest capacity. So, we're going to have to start off in the 1960s. You have a very beautiful, talented, incredible, powerful, amazing woman named Sharon Tate. And this girl she wanted to be an actress. Of course, she was. She went to the studio to audition for a, a, a TV show. She just wanted to do an audition. And she met this producer guy who ended up putting her... Well, he ended up training her for two years. And he put her in this movie called Eye of the Devil, a.k.a. 13, its original title. And the movie is all about self-sacrifice. The main character 
has a passing resemblance to her own father, Paul Richard Tate. The character in the movie, Philippe, looks like him. And the movie is all about this character sacrificing himself so that the 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 the, the vineyard can have grapes. And she is a character in the film who she's she's evil, I guess, but she calls them out on their hypocrisies. She still participates. It seems like she's a prisoner almost. And at the same time, in real life, the producer who put her in this film introduced her to a very evil, very, very sick man named Roman Polanski. And this man has a whole story of his own. He has a whole story that you could probably just do a video on his own life and what he did and what he still does probably. Needless to say, he's a bad guy. And, you know, it's like, you know, you can't even deny that anymore. I mean, like, you could have denied it back then, maybe, before he did what he did and everyone found out. But, we, well, we won't get any more into him because I haven't done my research on him very much. But that producer who put her in Eye of the Devil, after two years of training, introduced her to Roman Polanski. And in this movie, Eye of the Devil, do you know how they seduce this young girl into this evil world of Hollywood? Well, first off, they made the movie all about her. You know, they have the, the movie opens with her. It opens with shots of her, shots of this other guy who's a supporting character, who's, who's the one who ends up killing. And they actually, they edited it to where they show that character shooting an arrow, and then the next shot is Sharon. Because that's supposed to represent the true intent of the movie, which is to sacrifice Sharon in the future. It's a it's a it's a ritual. The movie is an evil, disgusting ritual made by evil, disgusting people for evil, disgusting reasons. And do you know what else they did? They found her favorite actor in the man who plays Philippe. And they took that actor and they let them uh hang out and they let them act in this movie together. So that's how they seduce this young girl into this evil world. They, I mean, could you imagine you get to act in a movie with your favorite actor, or she said she wanted to marry him as a kid. Not only that, but she gets to star in this big movie. This movie is a monumental movie. Very interesting fact is that in the movie, the leader of the evil people, the cult, the leader of that cult looks like Anton LaVey, and he is played by Donald Pleasance, he does a fantastic job at playing this evil character, uh, he's crazy, he's evil, he's, uh, he's serious, he means what he does, very bad guy. And so you have this movie which puts her into everything already. This movie is just totally, it is the most blatant, obvious movie that I've ever seen where it's telling you right there, this is what we're doing, this is what we're about. We're going to destroy this poor woman because we don't care about women, because we're evil, piece of shit, cultists. You know, cultists, they don't, they don't really like women. And they make that a fact in the movie, where they make all the women sort of like prisoners of these evil men cultists, and they talk about how all the men are crazy, and it's just, it's really bad. 
and I'm sorry, I'm trying to fix something that I set up. <laughs> now I need to go to the bathroom, which is really bad. Maybe I should run in and do that, but I don't know. <sighs> I think I will, so, uh, anyways, I will be taking a quick break, because I, re I don't want to sit here having to go to the bathroom, because it's going to make me not tell this story to the best of its ability. So, one second. So, we have learned how she got initiated and placed into this world. We know how. We know why. So, what happened next? Well, she got along with Roman, I guess... I read that they had a terrible first date, a terrible second date, and it was really strange how they just got married, and it, I guess they fell in love. I don't know. We probably won't know the real story with that, unfortunately. But apparently, things happened such as he would go pick up girls, take them home, and force her to have threesomes with them. And that was, and he would tell her what to wear. He would tell her how to wear it. He would tell her what makeup to wear. Uh, he would do all sorts of things like that. He would, uh, you know, I, he was a controlling, domineering figure. He was exactly like the man in Rosemary's Baby that he made himself as sort of an announcement that this was going to happen to her. And so... At the end of her life, of course, they were celebrating Rosemary's Baby, and the, uh, she was also doing another movie called 13. It was called 12 plus 1. What does 12 plus 1 equal? 13. And, of course, she was sacrificed. And what they did was she wanted to get out of this world, get out of the evil Hollywood world, and Roman... He ran away to Europe like he likes to do. You know, whenever he has a problem, he just runs away to Europe because Europe will solve all of his problems. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, ugh, gross. So he ran away to Europe and he hired people to come and get her. Allegedly, uh, you know, I don't quote unquote know that for sure, but other people have said that and that is the... That, I mean, after seeing Rosemary's Baby, which is basically telling you what's going to happen almost, it's like, yeah, that that probably happened. I mean, I, there, I mean, he was their first suspect. When she died, he was their first suspect. And, and then, oh, that went away really fast. We all know how that happened. So... What happened was, in particular, people came to her house. I don't know, because I don't think that it was just the Manson family. I think that it was other people, too. I think that there had to have been other people, probably somebody who was leading the ritual, which would I would say would be Mr. LaVey. Of course, he probably wasn't there, but someone like him who had to have led this ritual, because I don't think, I mean, I don't know. But somebody else was there. I, I would almost say 100% certain I am of that. So what they did was they positioned her like the hangman tarot card. The hangman tarot card, you have somebody who's hanging on a gallow upside down with one foot, blindfolded and that's exactly what they did with her they hung her upside down with one foot and strangled her and then of course they stabbed her and all that they were doing a ritual they were doing a ritualistic sacrifice it is a uh, I mean that's just it's just blatantly obvious I mean you know you can't you, you, there's no arguing with that like these people were already some weird fucked up satanic people and this is exactly the type of stuff that they do. And so it's just, you know, par for the course with these types of people. And so, anyways, what happened then was they painted her blood all over the wall. 
they painted everyone's blood all over the walls and you know that that's another thing that will make things even worse and uh and of course the main guy who came there what what did he say infamously what was it that he said i am the devil and i am here to do the devil's work that is directly relating to eye of the devil because what did I say when I reviewed Eye of the Devil? I said, this movie is about the devil's eye on her. They had a behind-the-scenes video called All Eyes on Sharon, including the devil's eye. That would be including that. And then, of course, they have the poster. It says Eye of the Devil. I mean, that, that that's just... Because there's no explanation in the movie of what Eye of the Devil is at all. It's basically, you're supposed to assume that this necklace is the eye of the devil. And I don't, I don't think so, because they never state that explicitly. I mean, it's just a necklace that, that they can make magic happen with in certain way, shape, or form. It's, it's used for hypnosis in the film. It's used to make people go into different states and, uh, you know, become trippy and stuff. That's what it's used for. And then at the end of the film, there's a very, really creepy scene where the son runs back into the house because he forgot his watch. And he runs in and he kisses the necklace with the Anton LaVey character sitting there telling him, I knew you'd come in. So what happened after that was uh, Mr. Polanski became a crybaby, and he played the victim, and then, of course, you know what he did after that, <laughs> and, uh, and then he ran away to Europe again, and, uh, he's never come back for obvious reasons, uh, which, thank God he's in Europe, because, ugh, I would not want to be near him with all the power and influence that he has. Of course, I guess it doesn't even matter, since, uh, he was in Europe when the thing with, uh, with the lovely Sharon happened. So that is the story of Sharon Tate. She was sacrificed. All the other people who were there were not supposed to be there, but they all had to get killed too. And then they covered it up by doing another, they had to do another ritual for another couple after that. Uh, it was bad. It was very evil, bad things that they did. So the story of her is sadly the fact that you have this very innocent, amazing person and she's taken in by this evil society in Hollywood only to be sacrificed at 26 years of age. Age. Sorry. So that's her story, roughly. And I don't know everything for a fact, but that is my summation, monk style, that is exactly what happened for sure. Uh, there's probably lots of other things too. You know, I mean, it's it's really bad what they did to her. And uh, I'm going to make sure that people never forget it. Because we need to figure out who these people are, why they think they can do this, and we need to get rid of them. We need to uh, kick them out, you know. Uh, we can't let this type of thing go on. We can't let people like Sharon, who are good people, she was just a regular good person. She was just a regular American girl. And she was taken and she was ruined by these people. And then she was sacrificed and she was humiliated. Her baby was sacrificed too. Very bad things that they did to this person. So, that ends the story of Sharon, unfortunately. But no, it's not over. It's far from over. It's my cat, Bernie, sitting next to me, and he's just like, Marco, I don't like this place. It sucks. I don't like sitting out in the car. I want to go back in. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he's very... He's being quiet, though, which is pretty funny. So... <sighs> Anyways, and if you're wondering why I chose to do this video today, 
uh, people from that evil company are going to come here and they're going to inspect the house any minute. And so I don't want to be a party to that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to witness it. I don't want to know anything about it because these people, I don't respect them. I don't like them. I don't want to even see them in any way, shape, or form. So I am out in the car, uh, barricaded in here to uh, do this interview. So, I was born December 19, 1998, I, either at 10.30 or 1.30 p.m. I think it was 1.30 p.m. And I never really knew much about Sharon. You know, I... I had heard just roughly just like, oh, she was pregnant and then she was killed. Like, that's all I heard about her from my mom. I didn't really know anything about her or any of her movies or anything. But there was this one movie that I always loved watching as a kid. And it was called Dracula in the Movies. I have the VHS right here with me. This VHS... It, I loved watching it so much. It's literally an hour of trailers of vampire movies. It's just a compilation of trailers, and it is just so fun. It's so cool. It has clips from the movies. It's, it's amazing. And one of the trailers in this movie is Fearless Vampire Killers. And, of course... That is the movie that Sharon did with Roman after she was introduced to him by this producer figure. And I thought the trail the trailer looked terrifying. I thought this looks like the scariest movie I've ever seen. Just to think of like how scary it would be to be trapped in a castle with vampires. That just, to me, that, that seems like, okay, I would never want to be in that situation. And so I thought it looked like a great movie. And when I was about 12, I decided to finally rent the movie from Netflix. And I rented it, and it was funny because with that movie I also rented Norbit and I, I I rented American Movie. And so I rented those three movies to watch. It was the winter time, it was December around my birthday. It was so cold. It was it was like a a a, a different kind of cold and I was sitting in my room my old room, and I had an entire container of whiteout Mountain Dew. It, it was new. It just came out. And I drank the entire case of whiteout Mountain Dew while watching this movie on my portable DVD player. And I remember thinking, like, this movie sucks. Like, I really don't like this movie. It's just so over-the-top comedic. It, it's it's just so cartoony, and it's not the movie that I thought it would be from the trailer. I thought the trailer made it seem like it was going to be terrifying, and maybe just the trailer had some moments of comedy that, you know, a lot of trailers from back then had goofy moments in them. Like when they talked about Brides of Dracula, and they called the main actress the Frances... Uh, Frances the country France's latest uh, sex kitten. And I just thought that was the stupidest line I've ever heard. And they did things like that all the time in movie trailers from back then. They'd have these goofy lines and things. And I sat there watching it, and I got really into the movie. Like, I really love vampire movies. I love Dracula movies, you know, uh... Dracula 80, 1972, Horror of Dracula, Brides of Dracula, Dracula's Risen from the Grave, Taste the Blood of Dracula's Fine, uh, House of Dark Shadows, uh, Count Yorga Vampire I love. You know, I love vampires. I love Dracula. 
I would dress up as Dracula every Halloween. And, and we, my mom even wrote a book. She wrote this little children's book where it was like me and I, she wanted me to, tr- maybe I should dress up as this or that. I should dress up as that character or that character. And then, oh no, I'm just going to be Dracula. Ha 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 ha. So that's sort of like the running joke with me is that I'll always be associated with vampires and just with Dracula in general. And there's a whole other story with that that happened that I won't, maybe I probably won't get into. So I watched that movie and I, I got so into it. I was sitting there with the cloves of garlic. I still have it too. I found it. I left it in an old catcher's mitt. And now it's just completely rotten, obviously. But I, I I, was so into the movie that I was like, I had this garlic next to me. I carved a steak out of a stick, a vampire steak. And I just, it was such a fantastic movie experience. I think I was eating like popcorn from the Christmas and Christmas candy and everything. I was having such a good time. And then I went out with my brother... And I told him, you know, I'd really like to make a sequel to that movie. And, you know, you should help me. And so, and he said, okay. And then we came home and I spent the, I'm not kidding here. This is the, the, the bad part of the day. I spent the entire rest of the day literally just sitting around waiting for him to make a movie with me. And he never did. And so I just sat there, I drew like a logo for the movie that I think I found. I drew like, because they had this uh, funny like cartoonish logo. And so I drew my own logo for like Fearless Vampire Killers Part 2. And I, I, I got to admit, like I wasn't really a fan of Sharon in this movie. Like when I was a kid, I didn't really like, because I, I thought that her character was good. But then they have this twist at the end where the whole movie, they're trying to save her. The movie's all about saving her in this castle full of vampires. And uh, what ends up happening at the end is that they save her. And she turns into a vampire at the end and kills both of them while they're riding on a carriage. And so that really pissed me off. Like, I thought, this is such a shitty ending that I really want to make a sequel to this movie to fix this crappy ending. And of course, it was also part of her story because it was representative of her being a vampire, being a part of this world of evil people. So it was just all symbolic in this movie that like, oh, uh, she's in this world now. So, and I'm just having trouble. I put these these winter coats on the windows so that I don't have to look at anything or see anyone. And the tape is is constantly falling off. It's really pissing me off, uh, this tape. Uh, so maybe, maybe I'll try to fix that right now. Uh, so one second, I'm just trying to fix this. Uh, so anyways, that was sort of my last encounter with uh, thinking about her for a while. Oh, shit. Come on. Come, come on. Come, just, I'm trying to, come on. Oh, fuck. Okay, I'll, I'll just go, I'll just go like this, I don't care. Um, I'll cover, uh, damn it. Come on. This, This is, come on. Come on, it's just tape, it's just... It's just arts and crafts. Come on. Okay, there's some duct tape. Come on. Tape. Fixing the tape. Come on. Okay. I've got some tape problems. Oh, shit. The tape ripped apart. Oh. Uh. Oh, shit. Okay. Uh. So, that looks better. What happened after that was, 
I should mention, when I was a kid, I've never really talked about this before. When I was a kid, I was a powerful manifester. And I say that in all seriousness, I very much was. I had an ability that I wasn't really fully aware of. So when I would bowl, I would go bowling on the in the youth league at my alley every weekend on Saturday morning. And what I would do is I would I didn't really know how to bowl properly. And so I would go up to the line. I would spread my legs open uh, like I'm doing a lunge, kind of, or like the splits. And then I would just throw the ball. I would just aim and throw the ball. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it like, you know, I, I would not bowl like a normal person. I would just freeze there and do that. And what I could do was I could make the ball go where I needed it to go with my mind. I would see getting a strike, and then the ball would magically go from the right side of the lane to the center, and it would get me a strike. I would do it all the time. I would I would get curves. I didn't even know how to curve the ball. And I would I would throw it, it would go straight, and then it would curve to the center, strike, spare whatever I needed it to do. And people were weirded out because, because as, I, as they said, I wasn't bowling normally. You know, I was bowling in a weird way that nobody else has ever done in history. So that's just one example. Another example is, I've talked about this girl in my first volume memoir. This girl, uh, this bully girl named Blondie, who I rode the bus with. I hated her. She was so evil and so mean. And, uh, you know, for instance, she ripped up one of my favorite pieces of art that I did. She ripped it up into pieces and then blamed it on me. And I was forced to clean it all up. I hated her. And I fantasized. I had, I, I would, I would focus in and say, I want this girl gone. I want her gotten rid of. I want her gone from my life. And guess what happened? She did something so bad with this other guy friend. And it was so bad that I had my mom call and she got kicked off the bus forever. And I never, ever, 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 ever saw her again. I got rid of her. I manifested getting rid of this girl. That's just another instance. And then, of course, my crush, one of my crushes as a kid, well, I'll say like Allison Mack in Smallville, she was a huge crush. Uh, and, of course, I don't have a crush on her anymore. Daniel Harris from the Halloween movies, I loved her so much as a kid. I wanted to marry her as a kid, honestly. And then uh, another girl who I really had a crush on as a kid, was Chloe Moretz. And I would just, oh my God, like just, oh, Chloe. I used to think like she was the sexiest woman I have ever seen uh, when I was, you know, I was like the same age as her, so it's not like a creepy thing at all. And what happened was, my family was planning on going on a trip to Chicago, uh, you know, to see family members like usual. And what happened was I saw online, somehow I found that they were doing this If I Stay book movie meet and greet where you would get to meet Chloe and you would get to meet the author of the book. And it was for free. You get to meet her for free at this cupcake shop. And I did. I met her. And I manifested that. That just, it came out of nowhere. Like, oh, she's my number one crush. My number one favorite celebrity is going to be in Chicago at the certain time where we're going there on a vacation. 
it because I planned this is how this is how weird it is. We were we were on our way to Chicago when I found this out and I told my mom and she said, "Okay, we'll go and do that." It was that much at the last minute that I had discovered this and this happened. And it was from all that focus, from all of that having a crush on her, I manifested meeting Chloe Moretz. And it was it was a great time, uh, except for my hair looks terrible, uh, because what happened was I forgot that I needed to get new hair clay uh, to spike up my hair, and so my hair looked horrible in the picture, but I manifested that. So... I don't know what happened. I don't know how, because I was, it's obvious that this was supposed to happen to me. This was always in the cards. This was always written to happen for me to have gotten this cursed object. I don't know why. I don't know for what reason or anything, but it was always meant to happen. And I truly believe that. And somehow, some, I don't know. I'll never know probably. Or maybe I will, I don't know. So what ended up happening was... I'm just going to get rid of this VHS. In 2019, 2018-2019, I was starting to... I was kind of getting, like, discouraged doing movies because... I had tried to make my first ever movie called Distorted Cuts, and it was going to be pretty good. It was like a crime thriller, horror comedy movie. It was kind of like Fargo meets Nightcrawler, and it was all about uh, this guy who makes snuff films uh, for this corrupt senator, and then uh, there's this other guy who's like a drug dealer, and... He can't be a drug dealer anymore because they're about to legalize drugs, uh, specifically pot, because he's just a pot dealer. And so the pot dealer sees uh, the snuff filmmaker's movies, and he says, I can do it better than him. And then he goes and he kidnaps a teenage girl, and he tortures her to death and makes a, a movie that is so disturbing that it basically changes the main character when he sees it, and it turns him into a, more of an anti-hero, a good guy. And so then he kills everyone, he kills all the bad guys, he has this love interest. It's, it's a pretty good story, and I really like it. Uh, I tried to do a crowdfunding campaign for it, and it got nothing. It got zero dollars and zero cents. And that's why I started doing YouTube. And of course, that didn't start off very well either. It took me a million years just to get 100 subscribers. And what the, the reason why I was doing this snuff filmmaking movie is that I liked doing research about true crime conspiracy. I liked doing research about uh, the process cult about the Son of Sam killings, and that's where I kind of got that idea from. So, after that, I was doing more true crime research, and I, I found this serial killer who still fascinates me because he is a weird, creepy enigma, and they never caught his partner, they never figured out all the people he was working with, he was a part of a satanic cult, and his name was Herb Baumeister. And I was fascinated by this character. I really wanted to know more about him. So, I bought... Oh, okay, I went on this website called Super Not. As in super, and then not, like naughty. Like, you're a naughty boy or a naughty girl, Marco. <laughs> so... I wanted to buy a piece or something related to her Baumeister so that I could have a psychic read it and then tell me how to, like, help me solve this case and help me solve this mystery 
so that I can figure out who needs to be brought to justice. What ended up happening was I also saw a piece of brick from Sharon Tate's house. It was a piece of her brick fireplace, beautiful brick fireplace, and I had already had a love of, like, brick fireplaces. Like, when I was a kid, we would go to my grandmother's house, and they had this room called The Addition, and it had this huge brick fireplace I was in love with. So this is why I'm saying it was always in the cards, is because when I was, even when I was a little tiny kid, associations with brick fireplaces they were already becoming part of my subconscious. They were already doing something. Because that's the reason why I ended up purchasing this piece of Sharon Tate's house is literally just because I really loved that brick fireplace that I visited all the time as a kid until they tore that house down too. So that's why I got this piece. I decided I'm going to get this piece. I'm going to get I'm going to get this one too. I'm going to you know, I'm going to get Herb's piece later. I'm going to get Sharon's piece first. I'm going to get this, you know, this this cool piece of history and then I'm going to keep it like it's a museum and uh you know, who cares, you know, if something bad happens. Oh, nothing that bad will happen. No, nothing that bad. So I so it was a Saturday when I got this piece of brick. What happened was... Oh, wait, no, sorry. See, this is such a long story that it's going to take such a long time to tell, to tell it properly. The day that I ordered this piece of brick for $255, little tiny piece of brick one of the last remaining pieces of her house uh, before they demolished it, which is good. I guess they should have done that. Uh, I don't know what they could do now to fix the property, but that was a good start, um, unfortunately, because it was a very beautiful-looking house. That same day that I ordered that piece of brick, later on in the day, I suffered horrible stabbing pains in my stomach. Stabbing pains that you wouldn't believe. And I thought I was sick. I th if it felt I don't know, it felt very weird. I felt sick. I felt like I had food poisoning, but I didn't eat anything that that was weird. Like I went to Wendy's and Wendy's has only ever made me food poisoned once. It was freshman year of high school. I was food poisoned by Wendy's chili. That's it. That's all. Wendy's has never done... Oh. Now the other wall is going to go down. Damn it. I'm just going to close my eyes or something. Uh, I wanted privacy and, of course, I'm not going to get that. Uh, I don't know. And I'm going to take a drink really quickly, even though it's going to make me have to go to the bathroom again. I had these horrible stabbing pains, and that was the first red flag. It was a very obvious, like, dun, 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 in my stomach. And then it went away literally the next day. It just was there, and then it was gone in two seconds. I should also mention that, you know, right in front of my house, the driveway started off as a railroad. And of course, railroads are where spirits travel. And so I believe that somehow spirits decided that I would have to be connected to this piece back then when, uh, when I was a kid. I believe that it all started on this railroad driveway. So, anyways, I bought this piece, and it was a Saturday when it came. 
And right away, things were off because it was a dark day. It was a cloudy day. And it was uh, the afternoon when we came back from shopping. And this delivery woman came, the mail woman came, and it, the first, it was not the regular mail woman. It was a new person who I've never seen again after that. I promise you, I've never seen this young girl again after this one day. It was someone who I had never seen before, ever. She was just there this one time. That's it. So that's already weird. Like, what happened to the normal male woman that she was not there that day? And what happened to this person who was there for this one time and that's it? You could tell something was off with her. And I'm sorry, it's just hurting me to talk about this. It's really, uh... It's like, it's, we'll talk about how I feel about it later, but you have to understand something, is that this has affected years of my life, and it's continuing to affect me right now, to the point of where I'm going to lose the house that I grew up in because of getting this piece. And I lost so many other things too. And I continue to lose things. And all I can think of is the fact that I shouldn't have been so stupid to have gotten this piece. To have gotten this brick. So, she looked very off though. This male woman, this young male woman, she looked like she was having a bad day. She handed me the piece. She gave me a very somber, very grim look, and she drove away. I was excited. I took the piece out. I looked at it. I took pictures of it. I posted about getting it, and then I just put it in a drawer next to my couch where I sit and uh, do work for, like, the channel and stuff and watch movies and stuff. After that... I started to suffer from what I would say mood swings. And I say that because it was like I could feel two distinct dual energies. I could feel one energy that was evil and bad. And I could feel another energy that was lustful and loving. Those two energies are what I felt starting from ever since I opened up the piece. It was a very strange feeling. It was like on one one side I'm feeling so complete, so satisfied, so happy. And on the other side I'm feeling in danger. I'm feeling these very dark feelings and I don't mind telling you this because it's related to this piece I had such strong hormones as a teenager I would just you know I would (laughs) but it, it got so much worse once I got this piece I had already you know when you grow up when you become an adult those, those hormones, they kind of start to wear off. They kind of start to go away and you're not as fully charged as you were when you, as you were when you were a, a younger teenager. But they came back with a vengeance and I had these just these urges, these feelings. And I'm saying that like in a dark way, like to where it was so over the top that four, three or four times a day, I would have to do something about it. And I don't want to get any more graphic than that, but, uh, it was bad. And I noticed I I would have these arguments with people. I would just get really angry and start shouting. I had, I had these horrible feelings inside me. And all I could think of was that I'm not going to blame all this shit on this stupid little piece of brick. I'm not going to be that guy who's like, 
oh, I have all these problems. Uh, I'm just going to blame them on this little piece from a house where something horrible happened. I'm not going to be that guy. But that was the mistake that I did because that's why it led to even worse things. What happened after that was I was getting ready to get my driver's license. And I was a very good driver. You know, I was such a good driver that I drove on the highway on a Sunday in the middle of a rainstorm. That's how good of a driver I had become at that point. But then, then something happened. We went to CVS and I was driving in the parking lot. And I was pulling into a spot. And I slammed my foot on the gas. Slammed it. Because I thought it was the brake. And so I wanted to slow down to park. And so I slammed my foot into the wrong pedal. And it pushed the car to where it it cracked part of the license plate. And it broke off and it crashed into a tree. That was the first thing that happened. And so that was because of buying this cursed piece of brick. Because I, I it was for sure that I put my foot on the brake. I pressed it down like I would pressing a brake. And instead I pressed the gas. That was bad. Then I was getting ready to take the driver's test. I was very nervous. I was very, very nervous and about even passing the inspection of like, oh, uh, is your car working? Is your car, everything with your car okay? I was already worried about that. So this woman came out and she got in the car with me. And immediately I started being very nervous and shaky. And and sure, I am nervous when I take tests but not to this extent. My hands started shaking to the point of like having Parkinson's disease. They were shaking so hard I couldn't even drive like properly. Like my hands were shaking to where the wheel was shaking and she noticed. She said, you're shaking, you're shaking. What is going on? And I was pulling out And I pulled out right in front of a car as the car turned the corner. And she was like, why did you do that? And I was in like a, this, this terrified trance to where I just, I couldn't answer. And I just, you know, I said, I didn't say anything. And she sort of thought about it. And then she told me, uh, she told me that, you know, actually the car was far enough away. So you're fine. And my hands were, they were just so shaky. It was like having, something was inside of me. I felt a weight on my shoulders. I felt a suffocating feeling in my neck. Like I was having trouble breathing. I was having chills. I was, I was pouring with sweat. And, and then I got to this part where I had to pull out. I had to turn left. Uh, and I, and I had to look to see if any cars were coming and there was, there was no cars. I swear to you, there was no car to this day. I swear there was nothing. I looked and I looked, I looked multiple times. I spent so much time, but I was scared. I was scared that if I spent too much time looking for a car, that I would fail the test because like, oh, you're hesitating. I'm going to mark points off for that. And so I pulled out. And right when I pulled out, a red car zoomed in 50 miles per hour in a fucking 
neighborhood. And this car was buzzing through the neighborhood, speeding 50 miles an hour. And I was sitting there and I, I had to slam on the brakes in the middle of this. And at the same time, another car came in from the left. And so that is what happened. And immediately she yelled, screamed, oh my God. And she failed me. I failed the test. That happened because of buying this cursed piece of brick. And guess what? As soon as I failed the test, as soon as that thing happened, I felt a weight lift off of my shoulders. I felt just like normal. I went over to the maneuverability, the cone test, and I aced that, quote-unquote, with flying colors. It was like something wanted me to fail. It was like something came inside of me so that I would fail, and then as soon as I failed, it's because she she erased that first error, and it's like, oh, he's going to get away after, uh, he's going to pass after making that first, quote-unquote, mistake, we're going to make sure that he makes another mistake even worse. And I was crying, of course. I was horribly upset. Horribly upset. And I just, it was a terrible day. And then the next day, from then on, I started having these ear problems where I had all this earwax trapped into my ears. I've never had that problem since, hardly at all. I have a little bit of earwax issues sometimes because I wear earphones a lot. I wear them all the time, and I still do. But at this particular point, I had constantly, I would lose my hearing, and then I get it back. And then I lose my hearing again, and then I get it back again. And I had this problem. I had to dig, 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 dig dig earwax out of my ear, this black earwax. It was horrible. And this certain day where I had it, I had to mow the lawn because there was a tornado coming. And this was an infamous event in Beaver Creek, Ohio, where I live, Beaver Creek Township. Three tornadoes came for our uh, county, Green County. They avoided our house completely somehow completely so those things happen and uh I was really freaked out I was honestly really really freaked out I hated the feeling of being with this piece of brick sit because I would sit next to it for hours and hours of the day and uh it was doing really bad things and but at the same time I felt some sort of a strong connection in it I felt some sort of a of a good thing like a like a, a like a feeling of meeting someone or something like ha- it was weird it's like love and hate at the same time so i wanted to get rid of it and i knew this girl i still know her name Cindy she's another horror filmmaker like me i gave the piece a brick to her because she said she was going to auction it off for charity at this horror convention that she did. Uh, well, you, you, I'm not going to tell her story, but uh, ever since she got it, she had terrible luck. And then, of course, the bad luck and the spirits stayed with me too. So after that, I was writing... In fact, I have notes... I was writing a movie script, another movie script for a vampire movie. The main female character in the script, originally, I didn't have a last name for her. I wrote that her character was supposed to be named Allie in January when I started writing the movie. Well, after I had gotten this piece... I had come up with a name for her character. I had come up with the last name of Bird, is in B Y R D. So her name is Allie Bird. 
Well, the architect who designed Sharon Tate's house was named Robert Byrd. So, that's just one thing to point out out of many things. Another thing to point out is that I read this in an article on Sharon Tate's first date with Roman Polanski. They did not talk to each other. Well, in my film, the first thing that I came up with was the idea of a date. The idea of these two main characters who, you know, you have this popular girl, Allie Bird, a blonde girl, and 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 you have this guy who's like, he's kind of like a nerdy outcast. He just moved there from Germany. And they go on the state together and, and they, they have trouble talking because, you know, they're from different worlds. They're from different backgrounds. And so they don't even talk really. And it's just, it's a very uncomfortable sequence because she's hypnotized and uh, and she actually does something really creepy in the restaurant and it, it creates a scene and it, it's like, oh, it's like their first date, I guess, where they didn't talk. And that's all I can think of. Uh, so th- you have that. And lots of bad things happen with this movie. Making this movie in terms of casting. I had such a hard time casting. Which, you know, casting is really a big issue nowadays. Because actors are flakes and frauds. You know, it's really hard to find actors who actually act. It's hard to find actors who actually come there and do the work. And this this uh this movie I've been bitten I it was it was a nightmare and I thought this movie has to be cursed because I cannot it everything's falling apart. I would do things then they fall apart. I would cast people then excuse me and then they would leave. And uh, I ended up casting like six or seven main characters. Or not main characters, but you know, characters for the movie. And eventually, one by one of them ended up dropping off of the movie. So first off, you had this woman from Germany. She dropped off of the movie for no reason. She just stopped communicating and it's like, "Oh, okay, she's not going to do the move anymore." Then you had this guy from Maine and he was supposed to be in the movie and eventually he stopped talking to me and he dropped off of the movie. It was like he was another flake, another fraud. I couldn't get any answer from him at all. That dropped off of the movie. And then I met this redhead girl, and she was so into being in the movie that she offered to pay for her own uh, plane flight here and back in exchange for not having to do an audition. And so I, I, I said that's fine because you know, uh, you know, you're pretty good uh, in terms of you kind of fit the character, in my opinion. You really. I can picture you as the character, so that's fine. Uh, She eventually dropped off the movie because she has this weird thing where it's like, I've never met you, so I don't know if you're real or not. And it's like, okay, fuck off. Like, just like, okay, how can anyone make any movie then? Like, I said, "I'll I'll talk to you on video chat. I'll do whatever you want. And she refuses to do anything. And so it's like, oh, I guess she's not going to be in the movie because, uh, you know, whatever. And so then I guess she'll get to flake off and I'll show her the film. And she'll be like, oh, well, I didn't know you were real, so whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's what you have to deal with when you cast people now. And it's like, what do I have to do? Do I have to show you my birth certificate or something? And then... The actress playing Allie. She was the first person I cast. She was a very, very, very nice person. Uh, (coughs) 
I supported her soccer games. I would talk to her all the time. I would say, you know, do you have an idea for any movie or short film? I'd love to make that in the future. And she did. She had an idea for, like, uh, a dream. She wanted to make this zombie dream into a movie. And I said, okay, cool. I'll do that for sure. And then she got married. And, and she said, because she got married, she can't be in the film anymore because her, her husband is jealous. And so so that was another person who just dropped off in the movie. And it was it was so heartbreaking to see, like, one by one, every main character who I had cast, except for myself, was dropping off of this movie that I cared so much about and that they were dropping off like flies. And for the character of Kaylee, I had cast this Puerto Rican girl and uh, she wanted to be in the movie for sure and she auditioned her audition was really good and then she did the thing where she stopped communicating she stopped messaging back and she dropped off the movie to where now she lives in Puerto Rico and I can't even get her to be in anything because now she won't be in anything unless you pay her to be in it and so uh, even though she already agreed to be in my movie for free uh, years ago, she agreed. Now, all of a sudden, never mind. So, that is the situation with I've Been Bitten. That is what happened. And I had trouble because as soon as I wanted to start making the movie, that's when the pandemic happened. And and it made it to where, you know, you can't film in schools. You know, it would cost like a fortune to film my movie because you'd have to film it in the school and you'd have to uh, pay for the insurance and everything. And so that made that impossible to do. So that movie, it was just destroyed. It was just completely and utterly a failure. And it was so horrible. It was like, okay, this is my second movie. I thought maybe it'll happen because I'm making a vampire movie. It's more personal to me it's more related to me and uh no didn't happen but let's talk about the year of 2020 because everyone in 2020 everyone else was worried about my pandemic and my covid and my shots and everything you know what i was worried about i was worried about completely different things so what happened was I had gotten two things, two collectibles after I had gotten this piece of brick without any problem or anything. So first off, I, I bought two pictures of Audrey Hepburn that have never been published. And they are original pictures that were taken by the photographer. And I bought those for $90. Then I bought a piece of the Goonies porch. The Goonies porch, which apparently it rotted off, and the owners, they sold pieces of it uh, for like $40 a piece. And so I got that. I got a piece of the Goonies house. No problem. Well, then in February, I was thinking about getting a piece, uh, or I was thinking about getting a screen-used prop for $2,000 from a murder mystery comedy movie. And uh, so my cat is like rubbing into my feet and everything. It's really funny. He's like sitting underneath the car seat now. That's pretty funny. Uh, at least he's keeping me warm. So I wanted to buy this, this uh, prop. And it was a rainy day. It was a dark day. It was February 27th. This is where I went to the gym. And what happened was it was leg day. It was a Tuesday. And it was I had the, the bidding page open. I had the auction page open so that I could look at it after I was done working out. So I go into the gym... And keep in mind, what I thought 
was that if I gave the piece of brick away and if I forgot about it, if I acted like, oh, the, the piece of brick isn't doing anything, then nothing is going to happen. Nothing bad's going to happen after that. So that was bad. That was a very bad thing. Very, very bad. Well, what happened was the leg curl machines, what I do when I work out legs is I do leg curls and then I do leg extensions and that's it. Because I was born naturally with big, strong, huge legs. My legs have always been like tree trunks, which is what uh, another grandmother said, my other grandmother she said my legs are like tree trunks, and they've always been like that, always. It was mostly from when I was a baby, and everyone else, when they were babies, they would crawl while I would scoot myself around and do, like, exorcist, like, spider walking or crab walking, and, you know, I would scoot around. And so I built up my legs as a baby. So the seated leg curl machine was closed literally only because they needed to replace the seat. They needed a new seat. That's it. So what I decided to do was do this standing leg curl. It's this machine where it, it really it works your glutes. It's like a glute isolation machine. And I thought it would be good to do that. I went on there. Usually on that machine, I, I had started using it once every three weeks. Because uh, this one guy, he said that you should do that for glutes. Uh, he said you should work hamstrings, quadriceps, and glutes. You know, you need to work each body part. Uh, so I started doing that machine. Usually I would get up to 65 pounds on this machine. On this day, somehow, I got all the way up to 180 pounds. The maximum weight on the machine. And then after that, I went over and I got 10-pound dumbbells, and I put those on top of the machine too. And I did even more with those. And, I, and keep in mind, I would only do one. I would go one, and then I would get another weight. One. And I was like, it was like, I wasn't showing off. I just had thought, like, oh, wow, let's see how far this can go. So immediately after that, I had like a weird feeling in my stomach. I had like sort of like a sore feeling, like a, like a sour, sad feeling in my stomach. And I ended up deciding not to buy the piece, uh, the prop from the movie. Because the price just got too much, and uh, I just decided, whatever, never mind. The next day, I wake up, horrible stabbing pain in my belly button, uh, like it felt like there was like a slit across my belly button, like just like a like a slit, like a tear. I didn't know what it was, so I just went around acting like normal. I purposefully like I I was picking things up, getting them for Safi to sell, and just you know doing whatever I wanted to do. And so I just acted like everything was just fine and perfectly normal. The next day, the next day it got worse and it just, it kept on feeling worse and worse and worse. It was horrible. I was crying. I was in such severe pain and then I was forced to go out shopping and I literally could not get out of the car and I took glutamine and as soon as I took glutamine, the pain was relieved. I normally take glutamine to to provide uh, to help repair muscles after working out. So the next day after that, I just thought like, okay, this is either a hernia or it's a torn muscle. It ended up that I really discovered it was a, a tear, 
and uh, it was a, a, a severe tear in my abdominals. And so I had to sit on the couch for an entire month. I could barely even move. I couldn't laugh. I couldn't talk. I couldn't uh, cough. I couldn't sneeze because it would all hurt. I remember laughing and I just felt the severe pain, the severe tingling in my abdominal muscles. And I would just take glutamine, take it over and over and over again. Conveniently, at the same time, in 2018, I I had gone to California. I had gone there to Chinatown uh, for one day and I I had gotten, I picked out, Somehow I magically picked out a moonstone uh, uh, arm uh, bracelet, whatever, armband. And moonstone is used for pregnant women. Moonstone is used not only for pregnant women. Uh, it's, it's to help with, uh, you know, with a new baby, to help with pregnant women. They wear moonstone or use it but it's also helped for healing. And I, so I looked around and I could not find the Moonstone bracelet. The Moonstone bracelet is, is still missing to this day. And so it was like that, that thing of healing was taken away. And so I had progressed a lot over that month. I had gone for, what I would do is every day I would see if, I could walk around for at least 30 more seconds or a minute more. And I would go in the kitchen and I would like, I would just be like, okay, I'm going to walk around a little bit, then go back to sitting, doing nothing except for recovering, resting, healing up. And I got so much better over that month. And then all of a sudden, my father forced me to come to his office because he was let go by this disgusting, fat, feminazi bitch. Uh, She let him go because, uh, you know, she thought she could do do his job better than his. And so we had to clean out his office for a month. And that meant with having a severe abdominal tear, I had to walk around for a month. I had to carry heavy things to the trash. I had to stand. I had to... It was... It was pain. It was torture. It was horrible to the point of where uh, he would force me to go on these 15 minute walks. And I, and I wasn't walking fast at all. I was basically like just clinging to the wall, slowly walking, barely able to walk because I was in such severe pain, such severe pain. And the only relief would be in the evening when I would go home and sit and rest and recover more. And this went on not only for one month, it went on for two months. And at the same time, something else bad started to happen. In February, when I had the abdominal tear to begin with, either the landlord or the neighbors or something, somebody started shooting Every Sunday, they started shooting like every day at these odd hours. I would hear (laughs) machine guns unloading every single Sunday at a certain time. It was it was so anxiety inducing. It was unbelievable. I would wake up in the middle of the night here and then all of a sudden I would realize, oh, somebody is shooting illegally when it's not hunting season and they're just shooting and shooting and shooting with no end. So that started to happen and that was really making me upset too because I felt I have this terror and I can't even defend myself. I can't do anything besides sit, watch things, look at my phone. I can't do anything. I can't even make videos for YouTube hardly. So after that, it got even worse because all of a sudden I started becoming afraid of home invaders. I started becoming so scared And so having so much anxiety, because what happens around here is that we live on a curve. 
and cars slow down, they're supposed to slow down, there are signs that tell you to slow down. Sometimes they slow down so much to the point of where I think they're staking out the house or they want to get in to the driveway and so they're slowing down to pull in. I became so afraid that for months I would fear just even being at home. I wanted to move. I wanted to get out. And so that's why I'm saying that I am a powerful manifester is because I believe part of the reason that now I'm in this situation where they're going to tear down a historical building is all because of being so afraid in that year of 2020 that somehow I manifested this to happen. Because guess when they put our house on the market? 2020. 20 to 2021 months after I was scared and I was afraid and I wanted to move and I was having I, I was so scared I'm telling you guys that some days all I would do is I would sit there and I would watch for the cars to come I would sit I would stand around I would walk around and say is that car slowing down I was so scared that I didn't know what to do it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. It was a nightmare. I was scared to go anywhere. I was scared of everything. It was so scary. And all I could think of was that this, I didn't think of it at the time, but you have to think this has something to do with the fact that, you know, what happened with Sharon. People broke into her house in the middle of the night. They, they killed her. They sacrificed her. And so maybe that's where that fear came from. It came from that, that curse, from that cursed object. And so that was another thing that happened. So I had to clean out this office for two months. And now I also learned something else in this time period. One day I was sitting at home. It was a rainy day, and I saw on my Facebook news feed, all of a sudden popped up that this girl who I really, really liked a lot, I mean, she was one of my, just one of the most special people to me. I had discovered that she was getting married that day. And I saw a live stream in the middle of a pandemic, the worst time to get married. She is getting married to someone. And then I commented and then she blocked me. And so I had to see that. And I couldn't think about it. And here's the thing. Is that I was so scared. And I was so affected by the fear of these imaginary invaders. That I spent the rest of the day mostly thinking about that and I laughed off this marriage thing and I said you know what screw this you know because what this girl did was she told me she told me years ago she told me she she has a hard time loving someone she told me she has a hard time liking someone she told me you know we can't date because I don't like you. I have, I just, I had something happen that was bad. I have a hard time liking someone. And guess what? The very next year, apparently, she got in a relationship with this guy. And she never talked to me since then. And, uh, and then when I, when, okay, I'll talk about that later, what happened with her. But I had to see that. So I, all those things happening at the same time in 2020. Everyone else was worried about my pandemic and my masks. I was worried. I was thinking, 
about this person who I cared about marrying someone else. I was thinking about these imaginary fears of home invaders, and I was thinking about this horrible, horrible injury. And it, and after we finished cleaning out the office, we would spend every day going on walks, and it just was not recovering. And I would just sit there in pain, and just sit. There, and it was not recovering because of all this activity. Because in order to heal this thing, you have to rest. That's just the reality, uh, you know. But that you know, they can't really handle that because they they think that oh, if it takes that long, you should go to the doctor. And it's like, oh, well, I guess it's just not going to heal then. And uh, so there would be this repeated pattern where I would rest for like a month and then all of a sudden I would be thrust into activity again. And I would rest for a month and I'd be thrust into activity again. And it would do the same thing over and over and over again, this horrible sore, bloated, stabbing feeling in my, in my abdominals, uh, where it would get better because I would rest and it would feel like, oh, I made progress. And then all of a sudden it would get worse again. And I would notice the same stages where you'd have the pain stage, then you'd have the bloating stage, and then you'd have the, 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 uh, the, the better stage where it would get better. And that's hard to talk about because I've never mentioned that at all to anyone. And it's all because of buying that piece of brick from buying that piece of cursed property. So what happened after that was that uh, the movie just continued to fall apart no matter what I did, basically all I did was just try to recover. And I just sat around doing nothing, and I missed out on so much life thanks to this cursed object. I would just sit there in pain, and I would sit there thinking about all the things I could do right now. I'm, I can't work out. I can't, you know, working out caused so much relief for me. It caused so much happiness for me. I had lost 40 pounds, and then I gained it all back as soon as I became injured, and I had to sit around. And so, after that, it just, it was that cycle over and over and over again. Where I would get better, then I would get worse, and I would get better, and then I would get worse. And then... I wanted to do something, something, because I was so irritated. I am meant to make movies, 100%, without a doubt, meant to make movies. And so I decided I'm going to make a movie with my friends, and it's going to be like a comedy movie. I'm, not, I'm just going to film it with my phone. It's going to be really fun. And you know what happened with that was that I got injured again making that movie. We went on these hikes and it was stabbing severe pains and then it, the, the 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 cycle would happen where I would lose all of my progress for the most part. It would it would stay at a certain point like it would be better in general but it would still go backwards and it would still go back to what it was like before a little bit. But it was getting progressively better, regardless. Uh, so, what what happened was, I was on the hoverboard, and he told me to try the longboard, which I had never tried before on this slick floor. This slick, slick floor. So I got on the longboard, and I fell, and I hit... I, I fell to where I hit my left elbow my left, uh, you know, hip and my left, uh, side kind of of my head. Well, years later, that is, is starting to affect me. Like I have nerve damage in my left arm now. And so if I, if I raise my right, if my left arm above my head 
after a while, I start to lose uh, something. I start to lose like circulation a little bit, whereas it doesn't happen with my right arm. And uh, and there have been times I can't even sleep the way I like to use used to anymore. And here's the other thing too: in order to help my abdominal muscle heal, I had to sleep, and the only comfortable way was to sleep on my side. And and as a child, you know. I love sleeping on my stomach. That's how I like to sleep. I would sleep like a... Oh, God. Now I just thought of another thing. I used to sleep like the hangman. I used to sleep like the hangman tarot card that they positioned her in when they sacrificed her. I would put my right leg up, and and I would put... You know, I would cover my eyes. I would put my arm over my eyes, and I would be positioned like the hangman when I slept. And when I had this pulled abdominal muscle, I couldn't do that anymore because that would make it hurt even more. So, uh, or that would, you know, that would make it uncomfortable. I wouldn't be able to sleep. So I slept on my side and uh, it actually really, really helped. And I, I would feel really better every time I would sleep, like sleeping like really, really helped the recovery process. Like every time I woke up, I would feel progressively better. Uh, sleeping was very, very helpful. So after that, uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah. And so, well now I can't sleep on my side very well anymore because if I sleep on my left side, I'll lose feeling in my arm. Because of my elbow, what happens is when you damage your elbow, if th- there's a nerve in your elbow that becomes unprotected because it's damaged, and so that nerve is more susceptible to to getting uh, you know, damaged or whatever. And so I can't even sleep on that side anymore. And so recently, for a whole uh, two weeks almost, I had lost feeling. Uh, I had had this terrible problem with my left arm. And so I had to do this thing with ice where I iced my fingers and it was terrible. And I read about it and it's it's a certain thing. It's called the cell phone arm or something where you hold up your arm too much. But what happened was I slept on my elbow to the point of where it, it made it bad. And so I have trouble sleeping now thanks to that cursed object. And just keep in mind, like, all this stuff connects. Like, that's the thing. Like, thinking about me used to sleeping like the hangman. And then all of a sudden, I can't sleep like that anymore. I sleep on my side. I can't sleep like that anymore. It's like this thing. There's two entities at play here. There's one entity that's her. She's not doing this stuff. She would never do anything like that. Even if she was angry, you know, I read... I have read up on her recently, and I have researched to try to figure out helpful things to know about her, and she had a mindset of going with the flow, and so I really believe that even if she was angry at first, she would not be so angry as to torture and torment me and make me suffer for years and years to come. There is another entity inside that piece of brick, an evil, disgusting, despicable entity that likes to throw things upside down. Because this year, 2022, which we haven't even gotten to yet, I call this year opposite year because of everything happening the opposite way of what I would have wanted to happen. And so we'll get to talking about that. And so... I had made this super dumbasses movie. I got injured again, and the movie just completely fell apart to the point of where, uh, you know, they didn't want to hang out with me anymore. Uh, it would be like, oh, I guess we're just, and then you know, all sorts of bad things happened on the making of that movie. Uh, you know, really, really bad. It just fell the fuck apart. It was such a disaster, and. Uh, but it's still, it is pretty good. Like, it has a lot of funny stuff in it, but, you know, you can tell something was off. 
and it ended where uh, basically it just ended. And this really weird thing happened when it ended. One day, I saw a dead possum in my yard. And the next day, I saw a dead green bird in my yard. It was like this green, like, marsh bird that is, never comes around here ever. Never has been around here ever before. And it felt like those two animals were symbolic of both my friends that I was hanging out with. And what do you know? One after the other, they, you know, we kind of fell apart for a while because they got busy, quote unquote. And, you know, and so it was like this very strange and eerie thing. And what happened, and I will talk about this incident uh, with one of them. I really think that he became possessed because what happened was he said during, when we were having this fire, he said that he didn't have any good profile pictures for LinkedIn. And so I took some pictures of him because I thought like, oh, I'll send these to him and uh, some of them will be funny, but some of them, you know, he can use for his LinkedIn profile picture, which he still doesn't have, by the way. And, uh, and they were good pictures, you know, like they were just good pictures. So he's driving me in the car on the way home. It's pitch black, dark out. It's really bad. Well, I send the pictures to the other guy, my other friend, because he wanted to see them. And all of a sudden, uh, my uh, the other guy, he, the I mean, the guy who's driving me, he gets really mad. He says, what? <laughs> he, he started sounding like that. I'm not kidding. And then he started touching the phone. He started saying, delete it, delete it, delete it, delete it, delete it, delete it, delete it. Like, it was like something had entered him and he was having, like, it was like a shakiness like I had had when I did that driving test. And uh, it wasn't the first time either. There was another time where, we were in the drive-thru, and uh, he was offering uh, his vape to the camera, and for some reason, I don't know, it's legal, so who cares? Uh, he w he got mad at that, and so he didn't want me to put that in the movie, and he started taking my phone and having the same thing where he's, like, touching my phone, taking it, trying to delete this video. Well, that happened again, and so I said, okay, fine, I'll delete it, fine, and he was driving, and then I deleted them, but then all of a sudden, I decided, I, I it was a stupid decision, because I should have just sent them as soon as I got home, it could have been an easy thing to do, but instead, I chose to send them right there again, because it's like, you know, you're not going to stop me, I took these pictures, I'm just sending them to my friend, uh, you know, you're not going to stop me from doing that. Like, it's not like I took pictures of you naked or something. Like, these are just, like, normal pictures. And so, like, fuck off. Uh, so I sent them to this guy again, and he looked over, and he saw somehow out of the corner of his eye. And that's, he, he started, it was very creepy. He started to laugh, and he st he was like, <laughs> you, you sent those pictures. You, you sent those pictures again. <laughs> I delete those pictures right now. <laughs> and he started sounding like that. And then he drives in the opposite side of the road, right when we're around a curve. It's like it, it, another car was coming. He wanted to kill us both. And he said, I'm taking, I'm taking us both straight to hell. If you don't delete those pictures. <laughs> and so I had to delete them again. And he was in the, he was in the opposite lane of the road. I could have died easily. And then all of a sudden, when I deleted them, he started acting just like normal. Just like normal, like nothing had happened. And at home, do you know what I did? I just went ahead and sent the, sent the pictures at home. Like, you know, you're not going to stop me from sending pictures that I took on my phone. You know, it's my phone. It's my property. Fuck off. So that happened with that. That was the last straw with him. 
Uh, but yeah, it was just, it was such a, the way that the movie ended was even more eerie because I thought, okay, that's the end. I'm not going to risk my life again. I'm not going to, you know, uh, risk getting hit by a car head on, uh, because I sent pictures of a friend to a friend, uh, really, really weird, uh, behavior with that, but what happened was my cat, Bernie, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to take a drink really quickly. My cat, Bernie, one day in the morning, he started peeing blood. He was peeing blood on the floor, everywhere, blood, 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 like in, you know, the movie, like The Witch, he was peeing blood all over the place. It was very hard. It was very hard to see that. It was very, very disturbing, strange, weird. Why was that going on? Uh, you know, my mom, she had a tendency to overfeed him. She would just give him treats all the time. Uh, like they're like candy, like it's like, oh, here's some treats, treat, 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 treat. You know, she would do that all day long. It was so sickening. It was like he gained so much weight because she would just overfeed him all day. Uh, but I don't know, like he, he apparently he had diabetes now. And so he got diabetes because of that overfeeding. And uh, but he was peeing blood and they had to stop that and they had to like, give him insulin and stuff or something, I don't know, and, uh, they kept him in the hospital, and so that day, I needed, like, a distraction, and so that day, of all days, I decided, let's hang out all day long, and so that was the final day of shooting Super Dumbasses, the movie, was because my cat was peeing blood, I didn't even want to hang out with them anymore, because I thought, like, I don't want to risk my life to, to make this movie, even though I had already done that a million times uh, with the texting while driving and all sorts of stuff like that. I don't want to risk my life for this, for this little comedy movie. So I go with them, and we went to the same park that we had always gone to over and over and over again. And I had this idea of, like, I thought it'd be a funny prank if we went to the river and then one of them pretended like he was, uh, that he slipped and fell and that he was being carried by the river downstream and that we'd have to go and save him. And Jack, uh, uh, he agreed to do that. And then he, all of a sudden he wouldn't. And it was just like this disaster of like where we were just standing around in this river doing nothing. And it was so bad and it was like, just like, this is such a, like, what? Like, I'm trying to make a comedy movie here, and you just have these people who, like, stand around. And so, then my phone runs out of batteries, and we go downstream, and I really needed to go to the bathroom, and I, I just could not find any place to go. And, uh, and then Jack got leeches all over his leg. He got leeches on his leg in this river in the middle of Ohio. Uh, you know, so some weird things happened there. And that was basically the end of the movie. Uh, the end of that movie was just c cut off. Like, it's just completely cut off. Like, what was, there's no ending. There's no ending. So that's what happened with Super Dumbasses, the movie. And so... Needless to say, I was pretty upset about that. I had other bad things happen too, but, you know, I don't want this to be a five-hour video. So what ended up happening after that that I'd like to talk about is that I met this girl who I really liked. And her name was, uh, well, okay, I, I can't say her name, obviously. She was a great big horror fan like me. And she was a special effects artist, makeup artist. And I thought, oh, cool, I'll meet this. Uh, maybe if I got in a relationship with this girl, uh, we could actually make a movie together and I wouldn't have to, you know, pay for the makeup and stuff unless it was just for the 
supplies in general and stuff like that. So I, I really, really liked her. Like, I really, really, really liked her a lot. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed talking with her. And, and you know, it was seeming like it was going to be a very nice thing. And at the same time, the winter came, I had a terrible birthday, uh, and we had this thing where our bathroom floor was in such disrepair because our landlords never bothered to finish fixing it, and so uh, the, the bathroom floor was in such disrepair that we almost fell through it to our deaths, and because the, the floor, it was, it was so weak, and there was no, nothing there holding it up. And so we were like probably seconds away from collapsing through the floor to our deaths in the basement. Uh, And so that had to get fixed for like a week or more during my birthday around that time. My birthday was terrible and uh, it was probably the worst birthday ever, I guess, maybe or one of the worst for sure. And then the next year came, 2022. And I thought, okay, I'm going to I'm going to start making a new movie. I, I I and I'll do something really easy. You know what I'll do? Instead of making it an overly ambitious thing, I'm going to set it to where it all can be shot in my own room in my house in my 1864 historic home. So I wrote the script and it was like, you know, it was like a a good script and, you know, it, uh, it had some problems, but I ended up getting feedback and I edited it and I made it a great script after that, uh, I improved it for sure. And so after that, that's when things started happening again. And so after that, I decided I'm also going to write a memoir because I think it would be cool to talk about how I became a filmmaker, how I wanted to make movies, and to talk about, like, make, like, a comedic book where it was, like, me making all these mistakes and me uh, becoming of age, you know, like a coming-of-age story with filmmaking, ending with me making super dumb asses. And I wrote that uh, book, and then... I th- I thought, you know, there's this one character in the book and, you know, I didn't really know what would happen uh, with that girl with the horror makeup and because, I don't know, I, I just, I don't, I don't and, and something weird, ha- oh yeah, something weird had happened with her too. As soon as I liked her and I matched with her, the very next day she disappeared. We had talked for hours and hours and hours. She was so into me, and then all of a sudden she disappeared. Like she had blocked me or unmatched me. And then uh, I had taken a picture of her profile because uh, I wanted to save her, uh, her Instagram so I could add her there. And I found that, and then I added her. And she said, that's really weird. No, I did not unmatch you. But I thought, like, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Like, it's hard to really tell with... uh, It's Dating is hard nowadays because everyone is so uh, one-dimensional and it's really hard to find someone good. So I wasn't really sure it was going to happen. And I thought, you know, I've made this memoir, and there's this other girl in the book named The Questionable Crush. And I had the mispleasure of finding out she was going to get married, too, uh, in 2022. So you have the two people who I cared about very deeply, was in love with, both having to see both of them get married. Horrible, 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 horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. I can't even begin to describe the feeling uh, that it is that you get when you have to see that. Well, I guess it's sort of like when a company called Kerwin Purple LLC uh, plans on destroying your historic home uh, so that they can build a step for wives development on it on top of it. I guess it's kind of like that type of feeling. 
uh, if you know what I mean. So what happened was I thought, you know, this is this is kind of cool because to me, maybe if I give her the book, which sort of talks, I mean, basically we had this history where we both kind of knew that we liked each other, at least I think. We never really talked very much, and it was sort of like a really cute like back and forth that we had, and I thought if I give her the book before she gets married, maybe she'll change her mind, and it'll be like a perfect uh, 180 where, uh, you know, it's like a positive thing, and keep in mind, I was not thinking about this piece of brick at all. So, uh, I gave it to her. She's never responded to this day. Uh, I gave it to her uh, the day after, on her birthday, actually. Because that's when the book was ready. That was another weird coincidence. Was that the book, uh, I had finished editing it on her birthday. And I didn't even realize it was her birthday, uh, and then I gave it to her and I released the book and it was really, really weird. And I thought, you know, it's just synchronicity. And I had this other thing too. I had gotten this fortune cookie that said, find something beyond. And I thought, surely this doesn't mean like find a spirit or, or you know, uh, communicate with the spirit because like, I thought like, oh, this just means like something to do with like imagination or something. So when I ended up creating my poster for my movie, all I did was close my eyes and the movie poster appeared in my head. And I saw the image of it being for sale on Amazon. I saw the poster and that's when I created the poster. All because of because I plucked it from my subconscious when I just closed my eyes and let it come to me. And where was I? I just lost my place. Uh, find something beyond. So I thought maybe it's all going to turn out to where uh, she reads it. She has. She's like, oh, wow, he liked me too. And then it's like, oh, wow, it's a happy ending. But no, uh, it was terrible. She got married. It was horrible. Uh, and it was funny, too, because on the day that she get married, we had such a terrible rainy day, such a terrible storm. It was a horrible, horrible day. And then we had gotten this food truck food. I got food poisoning again, sharp stabbing pains in my stomach. Very typical. And, and by the way, by this point, I had finally uh, healed enough to where I could go work out again and to where I could start uh, living life again, pretty much. Uh, I am still recovering, though, basically. Uh, still not fully 100%. And that's another thing that they talk about with these spiritual attachments, is that you will get a chronic illness. You will get a chronic health problem. You will start to get very bad health problems. Well, this is what I got. And by the way, this is the thing that I did with the piece of brick that I really think was a bad choice. I don't mind saying this, but I really wanted to connect to the spirit world. I really wanted to communicate and see, because I think that we can learn a lot from the other side. And so I took out the piece of brick before I gave it away to this friend and I rubbed it like a genie lamp. And I sat there rubbing it because I thought maybe if I rub it, I'm going to connect to the spirit world. And well, I think that that did the trick all right. And they say to never to do that. If you have a cursed object, do not touch it with your bare hands. Uh, well, I did that. And so <laughs> that ended up uh, making things a problem. So I had to see this girl get married once again, and I thought, okay, at least, okay, I guess that wasn't meant to happen. That's fine, you know, I guess it'll just be a sad thing, whatever. Uh, and so I thought, I still have this one last hope. Still have this one last hope, this horror fan, this girl who I really, really liked. Well, 
I'm in the middle of making my movie and, you know, I, what I did was I spent two months building a model of the main house, uh, to shoot pictures of, to make videos of, to be in the movie. I did all sorts of things with that. I was working so hard on this film and all of a sudden I'm feeling really good too. Like I started to feel really good. Like, okay, I'm going to progress to being back to normal. I'm going to finally get back on the path that I was on before 2020, February of 2020. Well, I was going to add this girl on Facebook and I because I thought it was really strange. She stopped talking with me or she wouldn't talk with me as much. And uh, I thought, what happened? Like, what happened with this girl? And so I go on Facebook because I thought it'd be cool to add her there. And I go on Facebook and I see that she's in a relationship. And so in the middle of all that good stuff, all that progress, all of that making a movie, finally doing something, becoming, uh, you know, just progressing after all that, have this thing happen. And I was horrified. I was devastated. It was so, so hard to deal with to the point of where it was funny because, you know, they talk about and like a star is born and then, uh, well, we'll, we'll have to talk about that too. Uh, the, all the different synchronicities with this, uh, they talk about how when you're in the movies, the first thing that you have to go through is heartbreak. You have to have your heart broken. And uh, this girl being in a relationship, that was what was heartbreaking. And so I had to shoot this scene where the main character, he's alone in his room and he's just working. He's having trouble working because he recently got injured. Wink, wink. And, uh, and he's sitting there and he's just, it's a very lonely scene and it's a very sad scene without too much action or and there's no dialogue too. And then he falls asleep. And this, this night, I, it was, it was like a dark stormy night. And I remember just feeling so sad that I was like on the verge of crying. And so I was sitting there trying to act and it was like, I'm just sitting here all alone. I don't have anyone else to make the movie with so far. And I'm just sitting here being in this scene in this movie and she's off with someone else and it was just such a horrible uh, feeling it was such a horrible horrible feeling and that that was what happened when I was shooting these scenes was that I was so into character because the character was really me and it's really me like having this like feeling this this emotion through this character, this real emotion. And it was like, why did this have to happen at this certain point other than to make a good movie? And so I really think it had to happen. It was meant to happen because of making this movie. And so there's lots of stuff with that. And now here is where I became aware Cindy messaged me, and by the way, I was auditioning people to play the main female character, Amy. And Cindy messaged me, and she said that out of nowhere, that piece of brick appeared in her washing machine. She said that she had put this piece of brick in the closet, she forgot all about it, she didn't even think about it, just like me, and all of a sudden, it appeared in the washing machine like it wanted to be found. And then that same evening, I go on YouTube, and I see a video of Sharon Tate, a music video, a tribute video, and the song is Don't You Forget About Me. 
And at the same time, I had also watched a movie called Stage Door. The movie Stage Door, if you don't know, in the movie, all these fake actresses, it's well, you, all these actresses are trying to, you know, just make it big, make it famous, and get famous. And uh, you know, a lot of them are suffering. They're getting treated badly by these casting people. And uh, this one girl gets the role, and she's terrible. She's completely wrong for the part. It's a, it's a big disaster. And you have this other girl, and she was just the most sweet, innocent girl. Her name was uh, Faye or Kay, and she learned on her birthday that she did not get this role. And she was just so sad. She was young, too. She was very, very young. And so she ended up uh, wishing this girl luck and telling her, you know, that's how I would have played it, the certain scene and everything. And then she commits suicide. And I'm not kidding you. Uh, this The ghost of her possesses the main actress and she puts on the greatest performance ever. And then the girl gives a crying speech and she says, I can't credit myself. I have to credit the person who gave this performance, which was her, the girl who committed suicide by jumping out the window. And so all of that happening at the same time, that's when I became aware that she was still with me and that that other entity was still with me too. And that's when I realized, oh shit. On one hand, it's a great thing because I have had a lot, a lot of great luck with this movie, with help with this movie. Uh, you know, just so many great things that have happened to do with this making of this movie. But on the other hand, I've had terrible, terrible things happen because of another entity that doesn't have anything to do with her. And so what is going on here? Well, that's when I thought back, and I have this whole, I have so much evidence. It's its like, it's to the point of where you just couldn't ignore this. Like, I'm sorry, it just all adds up, and it's like, okay, you can't ignore this. So, the house on the hill is like the house that where Sharon lived is described. That's exactly like the house in my movie, which also had a guest house, just like in my movie. Now, here's another thing. Lillian Gish, she rented Sharon's house. I devoted a whole month this year to reviewing Lillian Gish films. Lillian Gish rented the house while she filmed Duel in the Sun, a film I reviewed of hers this year. Do you know what that movie led to me reviewing because I was such a fan of Jennifer Jones? Duel in the Sun led to me reviewing and seeing Portrait of Jenny, which Lillian Gish was in as well. The plot of Portrait of Jimmy, Jenny, sorry, it's all about this girl named Jenny who dies at a very young age. And she comes back as a ghost and falls in love with an artist who's struggling in the Depression. And she helps him make his masterpiece. And that helps him become famous, a famous artist. If that doesn't tell you something, I don't know what will. So that's the sort of thing that happened with this piece of brick. That is, this is what has happened. And so there is a spiritual attachment, both good and bad. When making rice, I was handed the lid to the rice pot temporarily. So I put it right on the counter for easy access. I mean, I literally just walked over, put it on the counter. That's it. Seconds later, the pot lid completely disappears. Nobody knows where it is at all. 
I don't know how it dis- I don't know where it went to. And all I could think of was maybe an entity took this lid to another dimension. Well, the lid finally reappeared this week in the cabinet where we looked extensively. We looked through the entire cabinet. There was no lid there. All of a sudden, it's there. When shopping for props and wardrobe, what do I find? I find a 1960s go-go hat. Remember that uncontrollable shakiness I felt when I took that driving test? Well, recently when I was drawing a picture for the movie and I was drawing the main character, Amy, I felt for the first time that same uncontrollable shakiness. And this drawing, it isn't anything important compared to the other things, but those two things have just one thing in common, that shakiness. And so I I find that very, very bizarre. I sneeze a lot now. I never used to sneeze very much. Now I sneeze all the time. Even if I'm sitting directly in front of a heater, I will sneeze at some point. Sharon's father was named Paul Richard. I named the father in my script Paul unknowingly. Like, I I wasn't doing this stuff on purpose. You know, I'm not a loser like that, honestly. And I thought Richard Thomas, he would be perfect for the role. And so I actually kind of modeled my performance after how I would think Richard Thomas would do it. So what do you get? Paul Richard. Right around the time that this actress who was supposed to audition for my film, uh, what happened with her was uh, she ended up uh, blocking me and then she became a flight attendant or she was in training. And so I call her the fraud attendant because then after that, she stopped doing that because being a flight attendant was too hard So then she became a model, quote-unquote. And so that's her next failed flake career, fraudulent career. Uh, Well, I got a book at the Goodwill Bins. It was a Barbie book about Malibu Barbie being a flight attendant and celebrating her birthday on the plane. And if you don't know, they modeled Malibu Barbie after Sharon, starting in 1971. Not only that, but they were flying to Colorado in the book. Colorado, the setting of my movie. I watch Eye of the Devil, a movie spell about people being sacrificed for grapes to grow. All of a sudden... I see outside my bedroom window, grapes are growing outside my window. Grapes. Green grapes. I needed to choose a poem to read for the narration of my movie's teaser trailer. I went to public domain poetry and picked one written by Thomas Hardy. Well... It turns out the last book Sharon ever read was Tess of the Dubervilles, written by Thomas Hardy. 663 Thomas Hardy poems out of 3,554 poems. You get only an 18.6% chance of picking a Thomas Hardy poem randomly. 18.6% chance. As well, you could also talk about the weird coincidence of how the date that I had purchased that piece in May of 2019 was when Once Upon a Time in Hollywood premiered at Cannes Film Festival. 
names had a lot to do with it too. For instance, I had met a new friend randomly named Prudence online. This girl from uh, South Africa. Prudence was the name of her last pet, her dog Prudence. Only less than a percent of girls in the world are likely to be named Prudence. Last year, I finally got around to writing, I mean to watching Monk, a great show. His assistant is named Sharona. Sharon in his in that name, Sharona. And then of course I already talked about the songs. And of course there's a if you don't know, there was a 0.0000001% chance of that song, Don't You Forget About Me, appearing. This year, my mom gifted me the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood book, another easy sign to see. But here's the scary part. I was drawing a picture of a nightmare scene in my film when a character looks in a mirror and he's a hideous clown. I didn't like the picture, so I tore it up. I shoved the drawing randomly into this book on just a random page. Well, months later, I investigated the book. All of a sudden, I see, immediately, Sharon walks onto the screen as Freya Carlson. Carlson, of course, being my last name. So I just happened to put that in the book at the pages where that's happening, where it would relate to me. The chances of that happening were 0.25%. Was 0.25%. There's a couple more. And then the fact that I gave this piece, the person I gave it to, she's a filmmaker too. And they said that ghosts, what they do is they become attached to doing things that they did in their own life. It's comforting for them. And so... Her getting to attach to two filmmakers would probably be something very comforting. And recently, it's one of my last things before I get on to more evidence. I watched the movie Elmer Gantry. What do you know? A main character, the love interest, named Sharon. The actress playing Sharon in the same year starred in Spartacus. Spartacus being the name of one of the main characters of my film. And then, lastly, I have the written evidence. She said something like she sees the world like a fairy tale through rosy-colored glasses. And when I made the logo video for my film... What I did was I took these sunglasses that I was going to use for distorted cuts and I took watermelon uh, Mountain Dew and I poured it in this bag and I froze it with the sunglasses in it and that is the logo of my film, is if you're looking through rose-colored glasses. Now when I do art, Sometimes I draw pictures of my dreams, and I've drawn some very strange pictures recently. Very weird. I was drawing them for my film because I thought it would be cool to have these creepy drawings in the background of my film. So I'm just going to put them up. Oh, I can't. I'm not going to do it in this video, but I'll make another video. But there's one drawing that disturbs me in particular, where you see this man, and he's in the 1600s, and he's wearing a wig, and he's wearing these old-style clothings, and he's looking at himself in the mirror, and he's wearing female makeup, which is related to the film The Tenant, where Roman Polanski cross-dresses and dresses up like a woman. Not only that, but in the picture he's wearing, 
this bluish teal clothing. The same color of outfit that he wears in the Fearless Vampire Killers. Not only that, but on the walls for some reason, I drew a bunch of threes all over the walls. The Fearless Vampire Killers was Sharon's third movie. And I have more pictures, very strange pictures, uh, very weird. And I have one in particular that disturbs me. Where you have this girl and she's sitting in a dressing room. She's crying. Her hair's falling out. She's putting on a wig, a blonde wig. Because Sharon, her hair was not naturally blonde. I believe it was like dirty blonde. It was darker. You know, I saw pictures of her in high school. And you have this picture of this girl who's terrified looking at herself in the mirror. And you have the door slightly open. And you see this figure watching her with the green background. And the green color is the same color as the color, the green color on Rosemary's Baby's poster. So, these drawings... I didn't know what they meant. I just draw pictures that I saw in my head. But I guess, oh, it's just all fake. It's just all coincidence, right? No. I have some very strange pictures that I drew. I don't really know what they mean, but I know that they mean something. But there's this one that sticks out to me because it was a part of a dream. And in this dream... I guess they're fixing things now. They're walking in with tools to, so that they can fix things or something. You know, maybe they'll finally do something useful for once in this house, this historic property. I had a dream. It was a terrible dream. It happened the night before the Texas elementary school shooting. And what happened in the dream was it started off in the elementary school classroom where it was a very funny, fun, pleasant scene, and it was it was really funny and it was cool. But then all of a sudden, I'm outside in my elementary school parking lot, and I see this red and gray race car with a 13 on it pull up and cut in front of school buses. And the girl... In the car is a blonde woman wearing sunglasses. She smiles at me. She winks and nods at me. And then she walks past me and she starts killing people, mowing them down, mowing down children, mowing down teachers with a shotgun. The very next day, that school shooting happens. Not only that, but I had decided I want to draw this picture so that it can... Because I thought, like, maybe it could be an interesting picture uh, to sell. Like, it's a, it's a very weird dream, very bizarre. It has things people like, you know, a race car, a, a hot girl, a gun. Uh, right when I'm drawing this picture, in the middle of drawing this picture, the school shooting is happening. So as I am drawing, people are dying. And I don't know if people, like I have the evidence, I mean the date is right there on the back of when it happened. That was disturbing to me. I don't know why, how, why that happened, how that had, I don't know. So, after that, I thought like, you know, it was already, things like that had already happened in the recent years. Like I talked about for the Your Honor finale, the TV show Your Honor, I had seen the final scene of the finale in a dream right before I saw it the very next day. I saw the finale's final scene before I even saw it in real life, in a dream. And I, all I can think is, like, just why? Why did any of this hap have to happen? How did it happen? 
what's going to happen next. Well, now it's going to be got rid of because as soon as I do that interview with Cindy, she's going to throw it away and it's no longer going to be a problem for me. And hopefully things will turn around after that. But uh, I don't know. I just, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. It's like, just to think about like, just the stupid little tiny piece of a brick has taken away years of my life and now it's going to take away my childhood home a historic 1864 home and all I had to do was to prevent that from happening was not buy that stupid little piece of brick and all I can think is what is she trying to tell me? She's trying to tell me something. It feels like you have her, and then you have the bad entity, and I can't do anything about, she can't do anything about the bad entity. So, what happened was, I looked back at my movie, my movie script that I wrote, and I think it's pretty damn good, and I'm going to spoil it now. Because I think that this brings it all full circle. In my movie script, it turns out that a, that a cult is behind everything. There is a cult. And they have been in charge the whole time. They have been orchestrating things the whole time. And the main character disappears. And then what happens is that the the, the main girl, she is in danger. Her She had a baby with this guy that she didn't want to, but she did it anyway. He's in the cult too. She has a baby with him, and her and her baby are in danger. So the main character comes back, and he kills everyone in the entire cult with an, with an axe. And then he comes to her bedroom, and he says, you know, oh, you thought that I was uh, the good guy? You thought that, uh, you thought that the good clone... You thought that the good version of uh, the main character, because, you know, there's there's uh, tw uh, clones in the movie. You have the main guy who's good, and then you have his clone who's evil, possibly. And he's like, oh, you thought that it was him? Oh, no, it's the bad guy. I am going to be in charge of things now. But then it's like a happy twist because it turns out, oh, actually, it is the good guy. And he was so messed up that somehow he had thought that he was the bad guy. Uh, so, And then they, end, they run off together. They have a happy ending. But just the fact that you have a girl who's modeled after her, basically. Uh, I didn't model her on purpose, but what ended up happening was... <sighs> there's a whole other story with that, where the actress who ended up making the cut she looks exactly like Sharon not only that but she was she's also Texas person and there were all these synchronicities with her when right around when I had met her she had read a book where the main character was named Azrael and she had just finished watching these two other things that I had compared the movie to and so the fact that she had seen, read, and watched those things all at the same time was indicative that this was all connected. It was like, it's like, this is very bizarre. And it was like, I had to cast this person. So, um, that's the story. And uh, every, everything I said is completely true. I'm not bullshitting any of it, so please like this video, comment, and tell me what you think, and then subscribe to this channel if you'd like to continue to see more honest videos like this, because 
I really pride myself in being honest no matter what. And I really hope that after Cindy throws this piece of brick away, that we will get to keep this historic 1864 house, my childhood home, and things will start going back to normal. Because this is just ridiculous uh, to, to have had this horrible stuff happen. All because I bought a little tiny piece of brick. So goodbye everybody, see you soon.